All right, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. We are about to go live with From the Cutting Room Floor. This is Ebony Love. I'll be your hostess for this evening. And uh, I hope, I hope, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> so let's just go for it. Welcome, 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 everybody. This is the premiere episode of From the Cutting Room Floor. I am your host, Ebony Love of Lovebug Studios, and I hope that we are just going to have so much fun. I'm just, I'm shaking. <laughs> I'm shaking right now. So um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, I am here hosting you in my video production studio, which is always super clean. I also have my assistant, Sarah, here, who's going to sidekick and uh, help out with the episode today. She's going to uh, watch the Facebook uh, stream, which is streaming live on my Facebook group, not my group, on my Facebook page, excuse me, uh, which is Ebony Love, Love Bug Studios. So if you uh, are on my Facebook page, if you comment in the video, then Sarah will see it. And I don't know that we'll be able to answer everyone's questions today, but we can at least, at least uh, get you guys uh, uh, acknowledged. And uh, so I'm kind of flying blind a little bit here. I can't, the way that I'm streaming this, uh, I actually cannot see the activity that's going on in Facebook. But please, 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 uh, if you like what you see, if you like what you're hearing, if you're having fun, uh, hit the like button or send us a bunch of hearts. I love to see the hearts kind of come across the screen, which will be fun to see when I look at the replay. If you are joining us from YouTube and you are watching us from my YouTube channel, there actually is a little uh, comments uh, or a little chat room. So I have the chat room up. So if you are uh, watching this via YouTube and you have a comment or a question, you can post it there. So I know that uh, Melanie is, uh, is here and so she's watching from YouTube. So I wanted to say hello, Melanie. And uh, let's see. Hey, uh, Sarah, who, who's joined us from, who's joined us from, uh, from Facebook? Sorry, you'll kind of see, see me, uh, pass off to Sarah, uh, occasionally. So we'll just do that. All right. All right. So hopefully Sarah can check out who is joining us via Facebook. So just to, uh, if you're joining us a little bit late here, again, my name's Ebony Love, hello. <laughs> and I'm hosting From the Cutting Room Floor. What this is about, it's really about uh, die cutting. And um, we are uh, talking about die cutting tips. We're gonna share sneak peeks of stuff that I'm working on. Uh, we're gonna answer your questions and hopefully have a lot of fun. We'll do a little chit chat. And, uh, and take it from there. So hopefully uh, you guys are uh, having a good time and you will help to make this interactive. So coming up on this uh, episode, um, we're first going to talk uh, about fabric grain and that's kind of the, that's the tip today. I wanna uh, walk through fabric grain. I know there's people who are new to sewing or new to quilting and may not know about fabric grain and how we use it to our advantage in die cutting. So we'll talk about that. And uh, so that'll be coming up here. And then I answer a viewer's question about the labels that are on dies. So I brought uh, some dies uh, here with me. So you can see there's some warning labels there and there's like the actual label that tells you what the die is. And so people just had questions about that. So we'll talk about that later. And uh, so great. So actually let me have uh, uh, Sarah pop over 
and uh, and see what's going on with Facebook. I want to make sure we've got uh, uh, folks in Facebook and we can see if they're having a good time. So hang on, just hang on. I know these little uh, new technical things here. So. <laughs> So we'll see if we can. Here we go. Okay, so Renee, when Tracy and Cheryl broke into my welcome, 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 welcome. So Sarah, Sarah does not want to be on camera. So <laughs> she's like, how do I avoid being on camera? That's funny. All right. And then Lynn, Lynn is here from Australia. Hello, hello. And then Martha, I see you coming across from the Canadian border. So this is so exciting. We are international, you guys. So, so my, uh, my very first web series is on three continents. That's so exciting. Okay, only two. I only counted two. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So um, while we set up for the next topic, I'm going to have Sarah talk to you about uh, about a class that's coming up here. So let's just get set up for Sarah so she can tell you a little bit about what's coming up. Road to Scotland. An Outlander Mystery Quilt Along. A new year, a new mystery. Choose your clan. Elevate your quilting skills. Whether you're a fan of the books or the television series, or you just have a love of quilting, you're going to have an amazing time with us. The quilt is available in three colorways. Clan Fraser, Clan Highlander, and Clan Mackenzie. The mix of traditional piecing, dimensional elements, and unique blocks are sure to delight and challenge quilters of all skill levels and interests. You might be a little hesitant to join us because you don't like mystery quilts, or you worry that you don't have the skills or the time to keep up with it. We've designed a program that's easy to follow, has everything you need to be successful, and is sure to result in a beautiful quilt that you'll be proud to own. It is 15 week live online class open to all skill levels. It's only $89.95 when you register by December 1st. Get piecing and backing and quilting patterns, live weekly webinars to help you as you go. Payment plans and scholarships are available and it is hosted by Ebony Love of Lovebug Studios. Woo! Visit lovebugstudios.com slash classes for more information. It begins January 18th. 2017 and ends April 26th, 2017. We hope you can join us. All right, you guys, I hope that we are ready to go here for the next segment. That was, um, I think this replay is gonna be really interesting. So, so hopefully you guys uh, caught the uh, Road to Scotland information and uh, you also uh, uh, saw the little intro piece here. I'm really excited to see the replay on this. I don't know about you guys, but like I said, if you hearts and like that there are actually three different types of grain on fabric so I have a little bit of fabric here and this is less than a half yard this is actually from the Downton Abbey collection this is uh, uh, from the Dowager Countess uh, line it's her purple paisley and uh, so I have this little scrap of fabric here and I want to talk about fabric grain and the thing about fabric grain is there are three types of grain. The first type of grain is uh, the lengthwise grain, which actually runs the length of the yardage. So if you think about how the selvage is printed, 
this is your length of yardage. So the grain that goes this way is your length of yardage, and this is the grain that does not stretch. So, or I should say it stretches the least because there's always a little bit of stretch because it's fabric. But this is the most stable grain, and so we like to have uh, things, especially strips and borders, uh, rectangles, those types of things along the length of grain. The crosswise grain is what we call from selvage to selvage. So I don't have enough video space to actually open up this entire uh, length because this is selvage to selvage. But if I kind of open this up here, one end of the selvage here, it's a finished edge. And then that other edge that we talked about, which is the finished selvage. So when you talk about this, selvage to selvage is known as the crosswise grain. And the crosswise grain, if I pull this out a little bit, if I hold the crosswise grain and pull it, you can see that it stretches. And so it doesn't stretch as much as the next grain that I'm going to show you, but it does have a little bit of stretch um, into it. So lengthwise grain, if I pull on it again, it doesn't stretch that much. If I pull on the crosswise grain, it stretches a little bit more. And then what's known as the bias is actually what runs at a 45 degree angle between lengthwise and crosswise grain. And that is the stretchiest grain. So if I hang on to this at the angle, you can see that this stretches quite a bit more. So um, the reason that grain matters, and it matters in quilting as well as in garment construction. So if you've ever done garment construction, then you know that we use the grain to our advantage because something like a waistband you want on the strongest grain. So we cut our waist grant bands on the lengthwise grain. Uh, sometimes um, we will cut um, also on the lengthwise grain, uh, you know, something that runs up and down your body. So if you think of like the center seam of a jacket um, or like the center front seam, we would cut that on the lengthwise grain as well. And then things like darts, or sometimes you'll see bias cut dresses. Those uh, things are positioned on the bias because we want it to flow on the body. Uh, so our darts are typically uh, running on the bias grain because we want some uh, control over how that stretches and conforms to the body. So that's how we kind of think about fabric grain. Now in relation to how we use this on the die cutter is that we wanna take advantage of that. So when we're thinking about uh, cutting with a die, and I'm going to take, sorry if this gets a little bit loud, this was kind of not in my front space here, but this is a square die, and it is enclosed completely with blades, and I have this outlined with a silver marker, so you can see this a little bit better, and this is a completely enclosed shape, so if I were going to take this onto my die cutter, if I were running this on the crosswise grain, then what happens when this runs through the cutter is that the fabric is going to stretch through that cut. So can you see that? So if I have this is the direction of my cut that when I'm cutting this, this is going to stretch. And so what happens when we're using the crosswise grain on a closed shape is that it stretches as it travels through the cut and then once it comes out the other side, it relaxes. Close shapes on lengthwise grain, original shape. It is the original, the written selvage. This is a little bit more clear. So if you're having trouble with shapes that are short, it's probably caused by cutting on the crosswise grain because it's so easy for us. All patterns on the planet are written for crosswise grain cutting. You know, they have you, uh, if you read any pattern, it'll say, you know, cut a strip that's three inches wide by width of fabric. They don't say cut a strip that's three inches by length of fabric. And the reason for that is that um, length of fabric, it's really hard to plan yardage uh, for because uh, you just use the yardage differently. So let me just give you an example here. So. I have written on my die, you may not be able to read this, but 
I have outlined the outside of my die with registration lines that are a quarter of an inch away from the outside blades. I have videos on my YouTube channel that tell you how to do that. But I've written also on the die what is the size of fabric that covers the shape. And it's five and a half inches wide by 10 and a half inches long. So if I were to cut a five and a half inch wide strip from selvage to selvage, I'm able to get eight squares from that. So if I were to cut this, and let's say this were, I'm not gonna cut this because I still wanna demonstrate the other, the other concept here, but if I were to cut this on the crosswise grain from selvage to selvage, I would be able to get eight squares from the strip. Now, if I have a problem with stretching, they might not be very accurate squares because my fabric may stretch. Uh, so some people have issues with, you know, with some fabrics. Some people minimize that by starching and those types of things, but it might be an issue. So the other option is to cut a lengthwise strip, which would mean that I would have to cut first a 10 and a half inch wide strip and then my, let's pretend this is 10 and a half inches, I know it's a little bit longer, but then I would go this way. And, but if I did that, then I'd only get two squares per 10 and a half inch strip. So I'd have to keep cutting 10 and a half inch strips across the uh, width of the yardage or the length of yardage. And what ends up happening is I have kind of a weird piece that's left over and it might not be enough fabric for me to cut other shapes. So if you're using a pattern, lengthwise grain is not always the most efficient use of the fabric, and it's also not gonna match up with the fabric that you purchased for your pattern. So just keep that in mind. I, you know, I, I recommend using the lengthwise grain wherever possible. It's not always possible. You know, sometimes you don't have enough fabric or the pattern of the fabric, you know, it might be a directional print, and you have to cut it a certain way because that's what it'll take. Um, the, uh, you know, there's, there's several reasons why you wouldn't use the lengthwise grain. But if you're having problems with shapes that are not accurate, it's probably the grain that you're using. So just pay attention to that and uh, that should help you out. All right, so if you have any questions, please feel free to post those uh, in Facebook. Was belly is this way. So if you're cutting with the selvage to your belly, that's the lengthwise grain. If you are cutting with the selvages toward your hands, so if you kind of see me holding my hands here, so here's the selvage and here's my hand, and selvage to belly is length. It also means that you can, it's just easy to remember. Uh, you know, these tips if you just kind of think of it in one direction, okay? So that's the skinny on uh, the fabric grain, and uh, we're going to be right back with Chit Chat Cut. In the meantime, I've got a little trivia question for you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh my gosh, there just aren't enough hands <laughs> for what's going on over here. All right, so hopefully, hopefully that was informative for you and you got to see that and, uh, and that was helpful for you. So the uh, pop-up question that we had was, uh, you know, which, 
what's the best fabric grain to use for bindings? So I see Amy uh, and Carol had a couple of, of uh, questions or a couple of comments. And then Barbara Boone said, whatever Ebony says it is, <laughs> which is, hey, that's valid. I love that answer, Barbara. Love it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Carol said bias and Amy said crosswise. And uh, so, you know, this is, I love this question. I think it's, it's something that, uh, uh, you know, it comes up a lot. Now, I use mostly crosswise grain bi uh, binding, but it's actually not the best binding for your quilts. The best uh, binding in terms of longevity is a uh, bias cut binding. And the reason for that is when you look at that, um, when you cut your bindings on the bias, those threads are crisscross. So if you can imagine, you know, the reason we put bindings around the edge of our quilts is because that's what gets the most wear, you know, gets dragged across the ground, somebody's using it for a picnic, you know, it's in the sandbox, it's making the blanket fort, uh, you know, so it, it drags the ground when it falls off the bed, you know, so it gets the most wear. And so that crisscross edge, if you cut your binding by binding on the bias, if that binding gets a hole in it, or that edge gets worn, it's actually going to stay put. So it'll just wear in that uh, in that edge because those threads are really strong there on the bias because you kind of have them meeting at an angle. So if it gets a hole or it gets worn, it's going to stay put. The worst binding to, to put on your quilts, unless you need it for a design purpose or something like that, is actually lengthwise grain. So the lengthwise grain is very strong, but what happens if you get a cut or a tear or something worn is that that binding will rip right along that thread. So it actually gets worse <laughs> because, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, it has an opportunity to kind of tear down that, uh, that warp thread. Where, and then crosswise binding is kind of in between the two. So, uh, so it wears faster than bias, but if it gets a hole in it or something worn, it tears across the uh, binding in one spot. So it's not gonna spread this way. It just kind of tears open on the edge. I don't suggest that you, you know, you can do an experiment, you know, if you wanna take a, you know, take a little sample and, you know, poke a hole in it and see, you know, how you can uh, rip it. But that's why, uh, you know, bias binding is the best is that if it's, uh, you use the strength of those fibers kind of meeting on the cross to, um, to minimize the, damage that happens if something tears. But like I said, like 90% of my quilts have crosswise grain binding, but my quilts don't get a ton of usage. So I'd say, you know, if you're making a wall hanging, then lengthwise grain, crosswise grain is fine. If you're making a baby quilt or a toddler quilt and you don't want to have to redo that binding, you know, every couple of years, then uh, bias binding is going to be your best bet. And then, of course, if you want a certain design, like I love to make striped bindings and stripes look really great on the diagonal. So sometimes I'll cut a binding on the bias on purpose, not because I want it to be strong, but because it has a design element to it. So there you go. So Carol wants to know if she won something. Well, you know, this is this is a, a new episode. I think we can do something for you, Carol. So uh, go to my website and, and oh, actually, let's test out this email address. How about uh, send us an email at cuttingroom at lovebugstudios.com and uh, send us your, your address and we'll send you a little goodie in the mail. Sarah will keep me honest on that, right, Sarah? Of course. Yes. <laughs> awesome. There we go. Okay, so here we go. So, oh, we're in segment two, which is my chit chat cut. All right. So, um, oh, and if somebody's joining us a, a little bit late, I should introduce myself again and what we're doing. This is from the cutting room floor. I'm Ebony Love of Love Bug Studios, your host. This is a show about uh, die cutting and quilting. So uh, that's what we're doing here. All right. 
So, um, and we love it. If you're on Facebook, give us lots of likes and hearts. I love seeing that come across the screen. That's so much fun if you get a chance to do that. So I'm just going to pop over to the YouTube chat room and see if we have any comments here. And oh my goodness, we have a new person here. It's Mary Hodge. Hi, Mary. Welcome to the show. So Mary has a question about dye accuracy. And she says, how common are inaccurate dyes? I've had two four and a half inch multi go dies and neither one was accurate. Same with the three and a half by three and a half inch squares. Yet my two and a half inch multi squares are perfect. So I have to say, you know, Mary, dye, uh, you know, problems with dyes is pretty rare. I mean, they, they're making hundreds of thousands of these dyes every year. And, um, you know, and it's pretty weird. It's, it's an assembly line. The, there's a laser that's, you know, cutting the, uh, the path for the lasers. But what a lot of people don't know about the dye making process is that there's still a portion of that dye making process that's done by hand. So there are machines that will bend the blades, but there's, uh, there's actually a person who's uh, taking a mallet and hammering the blades into, uh, into the grooves that were cut by the laser cutter. So maybe in a future episode, I'll show you a die that I kind of took apart, <laughs> which uh, I don't recommend you do, <laughs> but, uh, but I had one that was kind of, uh, you know, the, the, a little bit of the glue let go. And then I said, hey, I'll just take the whole, <laughs> I'll take the rest of it apart. So, um, so I can uh, show you, um, you know, some, maybe some samples of, or, you know, this die that I took apart um, in a later episode, but, you know, so because of that hand finishing process, there can be some inaccuracies that are introduced. And especially, uh, you know, when you think about manufacturing, things are done kind of on an assembly process. And so if things are being done in batches and something went wrong, there could be the same dye that has, you know, issues with it. Um, but you know, to have those go to the same person, it's really unfortunate. So I'm sorry to hear that you had issues with your um, with your go dies. What I would ask you to do uh, with your with your dies is, uh, if you haven't yet already, cut a uh, cut the shapes out of a piece of paper. So take a piece of paper and run it through your die. It's not going to hurt it. So instead of fabric, run a paper through it and then measure that paper. If the paper is not the size that it should be. So if you're cutting that piece of paper on the four and a half inch uh, die or the three and a half inch die, if it's not four and a half inches or three and a half inches, then there is something wrong with that die. And the reason I say cut with paper is because paper doesn't stretch. So issue with fabric, which is what I was talking about, fabric stretches in all sorts of unusual ways, but paper does not stretch. So that's the first thing to check is uh, if your die is cutting accurately is to cut a sheet of paper with it. If the paper is the right size, then it's probably the way that you're running uh, fabric through the die. And uh, I think we'll, we'll have to, um, I'll see if we can uh, cue this up in, an, in another episode too, but I know we get a lot of questions about what's the right way to lay your fabric on the die. So I don't think we have time uh, to do that uh, tonight, but I'm just checking the time here. Oh my God, time just flies by. It's already 7.30. Um, so, you know, so we'll, we'll cue that up for an episode. We'll see if we need a little trick. So wetting paper, and uh, if the paper is not accurate, then you do have a defective dye. And uh, for everyone who's watching, if you're ordering dyes like I do, do that. <laughs> when you get a dye, needs are in the place that they're supposed to be, that the foam is nicely stuck down, you know, to it, and there's not something, you know, visibly wrong with your dye, because you have a very limited time to exercise your warranty rights, especially with some of the AccuQuilt products, because I think they only have a one-year warranty. So don't just put it on a shelf and then come back to it, you know, two years later and go, oh no, it's inaccurate, because you know they're going to tell you, sorry. <laughs> you know? So open it when you congratulations. Grandbaby number nine is due in January 2017. 
you got to get moving on that quilt. <laughs> you only have a little bit of time left. So, um, so use bias binding. Yes, absolutely. So if you want to have that baby loving up that quilt for years and years to come and you don't have to replace the binding for a while, use bias binding. Have fun with that. All right, Jeanette. Welcome, Jeanette. Jeanette says, love your shows. Glad you're back. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see, Linda. I see Linda over on YouTube. Hi there. And uh, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. So Barbara has a question. Can I ask about HQ Avante? I'm considering upgrading for my Sweet 16. Hey, ask away. I happen to be a Handy Quilter ambassador. So uh, I have an infinity. I'm a long arm quilter here. So we can talk about Handy Quilter too if no one else has any other uh, die cutting questions. But, uh, oh, look, Jean. Hi, Jean. Jean Black is, uh, uh, he's uh, over on Facebook and he's a friend of mine. Uh, and I've known him for, oh gosh, Jean and I go back. How far back do we go, Jean? It's been years and years. Actually, we used to uh, serve on the, I think it was the, it was like a customer community council for AccuQuilt, something like that, where we would uh, meet with them and talk to them about new products and stuff. So that was uh, really fun, really fun. Awesome. Madonna. Hi, Madonna. Madonna made it. All right. So we're just having a bunch of fun. I love this. And then Carol, Carol has 12 grandbabies. That is awesome. Hopefully you've got many children <laughs> who didn't that and not just one with 12 kids. All right. So my phone is just having a little field day here doing something really weird. Antoinette has joined us. Hi there, Antoinette. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So uh, next up, we're going to uh, answer the viewer question, which was about uh, dye labels and which way does it go in the machine and and you know how do we how do we set up for you know how do we run the dyes through the machines and those types of things. So that's going to take me you know a minute or so to set up. So uh, so I'm going to uh, let's see we're going to go into our next segment here and uh, while we set up. So here we go. So here we are in the next segment, and in this segment we are talking about uh, does the label matter on the die, and which way should the die go in? So uh, to help me demonstrate, I have uh, brought my Sizzix Big Shot Plus. So this machine it has a nine inch wide bed. It's not the smallest of the Sizzix machines. It's not the biggest, uh, but it's kind of in that mid-size range. And I wanted to uh, 
use this one because it fits on the table. It's not that heavy and hey, it was up here. So, so this was handy. So when we're talking about the labels, the question that kind of prompted this was someone was looking at, I believe it was a go die and they were saying, hey, there's this die and it's got a caution on the back end and then it's got a label on the side. You know, how do I know which way to put my die in the machine? Well, one of the first ways is, uh, and I think her question was, you know, do, do I put it with, you know, does the caution go in first? Should the label face me? Should the label face away? And, you know, so she was just kind of wondering that. And if I look at a smaller die, so on this particular die, the caution is on, um, you know, they're actually both on adjacent ends, but because this die is longer, they're not kind of facing each other. Where if I have a die that is kind of more square, this is a Sizzix die, so it has a caution on the side, and then the label is on an adjacent side. You know, so you might ask yourself, well, which way does it go in? Well, with most dies, it's, well, it goes the way that it fits. So, you know, so this die does not fit this way, and it fits this way. So easy answer to that question. But what happens when you have a die that actually can fit either way? So this is an apple core die. It will fit this way, and it will also fit this way. Now this particular die uh, does not have any straight edges on it at all. <laughs> so this particular die, uh, you know, it's not so much a matter of which way do I put it in because it will fit uh, either way. But where this comes into play is really when we're talking about the, the lengthwise grain and straight blades. So the way that I'm going to talk about this is, and this is going to be, I, I want you guys to just, um, uh, you know, take a step back because uh, I know that this die does not fit in this machine this way. I also know that this is a go die in a Sizzix machine. And so uh, while I do have adapters to be able to run go dies in this machine, I'm not actually doing any cutting. So this isn't a talk about, uh, you know, we're not having a conversation right now about how do I actually run this die on this machine. This is really just about the die itself and the blades. And I wanna talk about kind of how this works. So, if we had a machine that was wider, so let's say the Big Shot Pro, which is uh, actually 12 inches, so this die, um, you know, I don't know if it'll go through this way or not, but let's say I had a studio. Studio is 15 inches wide, so I could run this, you know, either way. But where it matters is you want to look at the die, and if you do have a situation like with this die where it will fit either direction, what you want to look at is the location of the straight blades. So this particular die has straight blades here on the edge, so on the, the dog-eared corners of my triangles. It has straight blades. The problem we, that we run into is when I have a die that has a blade that is parallel to the rollers. So my roller is here and my cutting goes this direction. So roller is this way, cutter is this direction. If I put the die in this way with a blade that is parallel, what happens with that pressure is if I meet this blade head on, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get some blade flex. And that blade flex is really just path of least resistance. What's gonna give up first as I run this die through? with the pressure of the mat and the fabric layers and all of that. So if I have a blade that is perpendicular, or I'm sorry, parallel to the rollers, I'm gonna have a problem. You know, the cutter doesn't want to do that. You don't want your blades flexing like that. And so if you have a choice or an option, and actually this clamshell is a good example because it does have a straight blade on the edge here. So if I were to run this clamshell through this direction, then I risk damaging this blade with that blade flex. So if I have a choice and the die will fit either way, look at the straight blades and just make sure that you're cutting so that your straight blades are uh, either perpendicular to the direction of your cut 
or if you don't have enough room, uh, you know, or if it can't do that and you have enough room, put the die in at an angle. And that's actually why you see, Sarah, can you uh, hand me this uh, square die? Thank you. That's actually why you see this square die angled in the die board. So you can kind of see that off to an angle. So if I were to insert this uh, into my cutter, because they've angled the shape in the board, I no longer have a blade that is completely parallel with my roller, and so I'm not going to get the same type of blade flex that I would uh, if I were running this straight on. So, um, you know, so to kind of answer the question about, you know, well, which way does it go in? It goes in first and foremost the way that it fits. <laughs> um, if you know, if you have a choice, take a look at the straight blades and just make sure that you're running it with the straight blades uh, either uh, perfectly perpendicular to it or at an angle uh, if there's room uh, in, in with your cutter to do so, to run it in at an, at an angle. So hopefully, you know, that helps. So again, you know, back to that first talk when we talked about, you know, selvage, you know, selvage to the belly. You can also think about label to your belly. And, you know, so, and it's the same thing with the Sizzix die. If you put the label to your belly, then you're going to be running this die through the way that you think about doing it. And then when you think about the caution, you know, the caution really doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's always on the adjacent side. So if you put the label toward your belly and you put the selvage toward your belly and you just remember to do that, that's just, it's a, just a device that we use to help you understand which way to run the dies through your cutter, okay? Um, but you can, just like you can put the selvage away from you, if you put the label, uh, you know, away from you, it's the same direction, it's just on the other side, okay? So hopefully, hopefully that answers the question about, you know, why the, you know, does the label matter? Which way should it go in? Like I said, put it in the way that fits. <laughs> awesome. So we've got one, uh, we've got another question coming up for you here while we set up for the next segment. And uh, so hopefully that helped you guys. And if you like the answer to that, share the video, give us hearts, give us likes, ask questions, uh, and uh, we'll be right back with you. It's so funny just trying to, you know, this is actually good practice because there's several things that have to be clicked and pushed and shut off and shut on when we're making these transitions. And I don't always make it back in time. But if you are just tuning in to us, I'm Ebony Love of Love Book Studios. And this is From the Cutting Room Floor, our premiere episode of the show about die cutting and quilting. So let's see. Uh... We are moving into the next segment. So uh, the pop-up question was, how many projects am I working on for market? So while you are noodling that, uh, and you might wonder, well, why did she ask that? I actually posted it to Instagram and my Facebook page just the other day. So if you follow my Facebook page, which is Lovebug Studios, so if you go to Facebook dot com slash lovebug studios you'll find my facebook page and it'd be great if you like and follow me there um also i'm on instagram at lovebug studios so we're pretty easy to find uh there but i post it so if you're following me the other day uh uh you would have seen that but you can also just take a wild guess <laughs> and see so we'll get to that but um uh, I'm just looking through the Facebook comments to see if there's anything new. 
And uh, so Lynn, Lynn said, what about the other die you showed us? And I'm sorry, I didn't see that in the context. So if you want to um, uh, ask, uh, ask your question again and just let me know which die you were talking about or at what point, uh, we'll try to get that answered. Jean says, I hope the label doesn't matter too much. Some of mine have fallen off. And no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't matter that much. I actually write on the side of my dies um, also uh, the Eden number. And if you're not familiar with my equivalent die notation system, which is Eden, um, that is, we'll talk about that on a future episode as well because I have some updates coming to that. But if you go to equivalentdienotation.com, that there's a chart there that has uh, equivalent dies across all the cutting systems in addition to the rotary cut sizes. So that is pretty, um, pretty handy. All right. So Carol says, wonderful question. I need to know. I've had an AccuQuilt go and a few dies for almost a year and never used it. Carol, hopefully, hopefully through this show, uh, we can help get you cutting because, you know, it's, uh, and we all do it. We all do it, right? We buy stuff. It looks cool. And, uh, you know, then, you know, we see the demo at the show and we're like, oh, that looks so fantastic. It looks so easy. And then we get it home and we forget what we saw and it just kind of freaks us out, right? Like, oh no, I don't remember what I saw and I'm scared to use this. And it stays in the box and it collects dust. But it's really, really a handy tool uh, once you get to use it. And I die cut all the time. I mean, every single one of my quilts and uh, the nine projects that I'm working on for Quilt Market, which is now three weeks away. Nah! <laughs> so Quilt Market is three weeks away and I have nine projects that are in various stages of completion. I'll give you a little sneak peek here in a minute. Um, so Allison, hi Allison. She says, congrats, Ebony. Thank you so much. I'm having a ton of fun. It's a little bit weird not seeing the direct feedback, you know, immediately. It's kind of like I'm talking to myself, but it's great that Sarah's here because I can kind of talk to her too. And of course, talk to you guys too, but you know, then I'm not alone in the house and alone in the studio um, with her here. So Barbara in the previous segment had asked us, uh, here's my Avante question. One, will a 10 foot handle up to a queen or should I get the 12 foot? And then two, how much room should I plan around each side to comfortably move from the machine, from the front of the machine to the back of the machine? Um, you know, that's an excellent, excellent question. I used to have my machine in a basement and we were kind of restricted because there were columns and so it was kind of tight uh, to move around. So what I would say is, so 10 feet, what is that? I promise I don't do math after 8 p.m. and it's 8 p.m. somewhere in the world. So... Uh, I have no idea what time it is. Oh, not time. 10 feet by 12 is 120, right? Okay, so yeah, 10, 12 inches by 10 by, you know, 10 feet is 120 inches. Okay, so that is the, so, the maximum width. But what you also have to consider is that your machine needs room to move on both sides of the frame. So you kind of have to subtract, I would say probably a foot and a half uh, out of that total. So um, what's a foot and a half, 18 inches? So you lose 18 inches. So now you're down to a hundred inches, <laughs> which is the size of your backing. And then your backing should be uh, um, uh, four to six inches on each side uh, wider. So now we're talking another 12 inches. So what are we down to now? Uh, 88. 88. So Sarah says 88. So that's the size of your quilt top. So at 10 feet, your maximum size, your quilt top is around 88 to 90 inches, which I don't think is a queen size. So if I were you, I would go up to the 12 foot frame. That's what I would do. Um, in terms of how much room you need around the machine to move, so um, I think when I measured, uh, my first frame was a Fusion, and I think when I measured that it was four feet from front to back, and I made sure that I had eight feet um, total. So it's about two feet in the front, two feet in the back. So um, now on the sides, you don't need as much room, and of course um, you can put uh, one of the ends against the wall if you wanted to. So if you don't need to walk completely around the machine, then you don't need the same amount of room. So 
Um, so when I was planning my space for my 12 foot frame, I looked for a, a space that was at least 14 uh, feet by eight feet. So that's kind of how I plan the space. What you could do too is just get the frame dimensions uh, from Handy Quilter. And what I did initially is I took painter's tape and I marked out the footprint of the machine uh, where I wanted to put it. And then I kind of walked around it to see if I had enough room to move. So that's just an idea um, you know, for you. But good luck and share a picture when you get your machine. Have fun. Okay. If my phone will stop being goofy, there's the, it's, I keep looking this up, but it keeps asking me to pay with passcode every time I hit the home button and it won't stop. <laughs> That's really annoying. All right. So Debbie, hi Debbie. Debbie says that helps a lot. And Amy says eight, eight, nine. I don't know what those are, but <laughs> you must be having fun. All right. Mary Jane says, have you ever reached a point where you don't want to work on a quilt? Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy, do I get to that point every single time. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff because I love um, finishing for me is kind of the best part, you know, so I can move on to something else. But yeah, I get to that point all the time, you know, and some things that kind of help me to remedy that is actually working on more than one project at once because I, I, get, I don't know if I want to say I get bored, but I have a short attention span. So I need to be working on different things uh, at once. Oh, now I know what the eight, nine was. She was guessing how many projects I had ah, for market. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, nine, nine projects. Um, you know, so working on nine projects at once in a three week period is I think the official definition of insanity. Um, but somehow it's going to get done. But that helps me to, it actually helps me to focus because I have so many, so many things to do. Um, so I'm kind of working on a little bit of each of them and then I can't get bored. All right. Oh, look, Amy. Amy found out three Andover, three Wyndham, and three Island Matique. Right, right, you are. All right, and Barbara says, thank you. You are so welcome. I'm just gonna check YouTube quickly and see if, uh, you know, anyone else has commented here. So Linda and Antoinette and Mary and Melanie are over in YouTube, which is fantastic. And then there might be other people who are there and just shy about commenting. But if you do have questions, you can uh, post them in the, uh, there's a little chat widget on the side. Look, it's Shelly. Oh, Shelly has to teach a class in five minutes. Well, that's okay, Shelly. If you have to sign off, uh, you can always come back to the video and replay it. So it'll be on my YouTube channel, on my Facebook group, or on my Facebook page for a little bit so you can watch the end if you miss the ending. So let's see. The last thing is the sneak peek. And oh, okay. So the thing about market is that there are new lines coming out and you can't share the stuff because they're new lines. But I saw that Island Batique actually released their lookbook and I saw the lookbook posted in several places on Facebook because there were some designers sharing their lines that are coming out. So because it's Island Batique and because we're three weeks away and I know you guys are going to just be shh and please, I hope I don't get in trouble <laughs> with Island Batique for showing this, but I'm going to give you just a quick sneak peek of the blocks that I'm working on. So I'm working on a, a pattern called Stormborn and uh, Stormborn is going to be available, um, oh gosh, when? In November. So that pattern will come out in November and it uses uh, the isosceles uh, triangle. So it uses those wedges. And then I had a custom die made to do this block. So I'm gonna show this to you really quickly and I'll put it up long enough for you to see, but hopefully not long enough for me to get into trouble for showing you this. Uh, you know, these are lines that are coming out and these are batiks and oh my God, this is called uh, press petals. So the white is just their solid and yes, you can get batiks in solids. Can you believe it? So this is their white solid and the rest of this line is press petals. And this is the uh, Key West block and uh, along with the isosceles triangles. 
So that is what one of the projects that I'm working on. And uh, can you tell I'm not very far because I'm still piecing blocks, but once the blocks are made, they're square and then they just go together. Um, so that should be pretty fun uh, with that. So uh, Stormborn, when it comes out, hopefully you'll like that pattern and you want to take a look at it, uh, which is pretty fun. But that is really the end of the episode, you guys. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Carol says beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, and before I wrap this up, I will say, do not ask me for the file for the custom dies because they actually came out the wrong size and, uh, I'm able to, they're, the block actually finishes bigger than it's supposed to be. So I'm able to sort of trim it up to where it's supposed to be so I can continue piecing it. Um, but I don't want to release that custom die because it um, uh, the pieces actually don't match up with the other die that I thought I was supposed to match up to. So long story <laughs> with that. And yes, I checked the design. Yes, I checked the templates, but uh, no, they don't match. So, <laughs> so I'll have to figure, uh, figure that out. But I actually am having uh, plastic templates made. So uh, so those I'm definitely checking and I have um, more leeway to adjust those because it's just a, you know, it's like a $5 plastic template rather than a $100 custom die. <laughs> so, you know, so I can do the $5 over and over, but the, the custom die was a one-time thing. So uh, Amy says, congrats on being asked to teach at Spring Market next year. Thank you. I'm so excited about that. It was actually my first time applying to teach at Spring Market. I didn't know that I have any ideas. Just, you know, submit them. What's the worst they can say? No, right? So I submitted and they picked up a couple. So that was really exciting. All right. So Mary Jane says, love the blue. And Amy says, thanks so much for all the great info. You are so welcome, Amy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this episode and you look forward to getting next week's episode. Um, I don't know what we're talking about yet, but if you have questions, I think we got a couple of topics, you know, from this. So I think, you know, we, we've got stuff to keep going. But if you have a burning question that hasn't been answered, please uh, send your comment or question to cuttingroom at lovebugstudios.com. If you uh, need to watch the replay of this episode, it will. Uh, I'm going to post it to my uh, blog. Uh, it'll stay on the Facebook page for a little bit. But I appreciate if you enjoyed this and you know someone who you think would benefit from this, please share this episode with them and have them join us next time. We're on uh, Mondays at 7 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time. I can't promise every single Monday because I do have uh, travel commitments and things like that. But every Monday that I possibly can, you know, broadcast, we'll do this again because I had a ton of fun. And I hope that you had fun too. Please like us, give us hearts, share this with your friends, continue commenting, and we'll see you next time. And until then, happy cutting. And of course... I forgot to figure out how to end this. Okay, here we go. Bye, you guys.